had, I think it was Tiffany, I hope I got this right, showed a slide that how we all felt, I think it was the emotional response to a question about, you know, what do we think about climate change? And so the words, at least, that I wrote my down, I'm sure she's going to tell me I got it wrong, but overwhelmed, <coughs> overwhelmed powers and depressed, I think, were the sort of the three big ones. And so when you think about that, you know, there's so much science and so much information coming out that's sort of telling us that things that we've got problems here and we need to do something and people are feeling this way. Um, and I'm from Silicon Valley, don't hold that against me. I'm not a conservationist in that sense, although my wife's been a green since she was 20. I first met her when she was hanging plastic bags, washing plastic bags out on the, on the, uh, on the drip uh, at the sink. So uh, I've been around greenies all my life. I'm a big conservationist in that sort. Um, and so to kick this conversation off, I wanted to understand sort of what has been the history of technology as it relates to the sort of the ocean and the, the land interface. And I spoke to some folks at NOAA and they were really helpful and they helped me put together this chart. I hope I get this right. Here we go. Um, and this, I did have enough space for the star charts and the nautical charts and all that stuff that happened hundreds of years before this. But at least the way they explained it to me was there's this notion of sort of wire line sounding where they drag kind of things off the back of the boat to get a feel for the contours of the ocean. And that led through a series of electronic kind of uh, innovations around oscillators and echo sounders and everything else. And we got more and more understanding. You see some of the charts at the bottom that reflect sort of the time here. Uh, that, that we started to understand what was actually happening at that interface, actually where that interface actually was. Obviously during World War II and after that, you know, there was major issues like running subs to the ground and things like that. And then in the 80s, I guess, we put out these NOAA Pacific arrays to really start to measure the impact of what was happening. And then somewhere around sort of 92 to slash 95, the, the world went from essentially single vessels doing things to this global view of the world in a way that just unsparked so much data. And, that was the, and of course, the declassification of that Geosat data became really the start of something big. And then 2004, as you all know, Google acquired sort of uh, the Google Earth technology, which then brought that into all of our living rooms. And I've seen most of the presentations that we've seen where they have that. And then there's in 2010 the census of marine. And so there's been this wonderful sort of evolution of starting out with sort of ships dragging stuff and it started out one at a time all the way through to now having a look at this whole blue planet as the previous speaker was talking about from a long distance. And I've got a panel here that's going to be talking about some of the incredible technology innovations that they have been doing. Uh, but what I think the theme is here is, is that there's so much data that is now available. Um, and it's an available from many, many different sources. And that's a cool thing because it goes from the abstract and the, if you like, the unquantifiable to a quantifiable conversation and can start to really pinpoint what is actually happening. And the cool thing about data is, is you go out and get data or create data and it actually gets used for many purposes. And in some cases, those purposes are actually unintended. And this is a little bit of research I found which I thought was really fascinating, which was, you know how vessels are out at sea at night and they don't collide into each other, right? Have you heard, you, you know that's true. There's a system on ships that stop them from running into each other, right? Well, this science group got all of that ship collision data, pulled it all in, and they were able to determine how many ships were fishing where and from which country was the ships. And actually, there's a whole research study based on where, did they, where, the, where, the, where the fishing boats basically are and how many of them are there. And it's really helping us inform sort of why some areas are being overfished. So the point is, and you're going to hear from some of the panelists today, that some of the data that we have in our lives that we use for one purpose can actually be used for a very important other purpose. And you'll hear about that. And in fact, I'm here to. It's great, my great pleasure to introduce these panelists. I know we're running short on time, and my goal is to really get questions from the audience as quickly as possible. So I'm not going to introduce them all individually. But they're all legends. They've all been in this industry, and they are doing unbelievable work. And I want to introduce to you um, Matt from XPRIZE. is going to start us off with uh, telling him his story, and then he will then introduce you. So Matt, over to you.
cool. So my name is Matt Mulrennan. Um, I'm the director of the Ocean Initiative at X Prize. We're a nonprofit in Los Angeles to do big prizes to try and inspire innovations that solve some kind of grand challenge. And so I'm going to talk to you about X Prize, our oceans work there, as well as Colossal, my ocean nonprofit in Los Angeles as well, in Venice Beach, uh, that's also doing some exciting stuff. So uh, I always like to start with this slide. Uh, John F. Kennedy uh, really defined what moonshots are, right? Uh, he didn't say, we're going to go out and explore space. He said, we're going to put a man on the moon uh, in the next decade. And had a clear vision for that. And now space, is really ch space exploration has really changed a lot of aspects of our life. And all these technologies and innovations that have come from that, including that satellite data that you were just talking about. Everyone's using GPS data constantly now. Uh, a lot of those innovations came from just having the moonshot, right? Um, to have a clear vision, a clear goal, and use the technologies and innovations, which are incredibly powerful uh, at your fingertips now, to try and solve those problems. So that's been a, a big part of my job. Uh, to take a step back, um, to tell you just who I am, I guess, uh, I'm a marine scientist. Uh, I went down, I was studying scripts for this. Um, I did ocean acidification research. I used to stick poor little fish larvae in more acidic conditions and film them to see what was going to happen. And um, I got out of the lab, worked at Oceana in DC as a marine scientist fighting against offshore drilling on the East Coast. Unfortunately, we're continuing that fight and it's expanded. And she'll be engaged in that as well. Uh, and then moved on to X Prize because I saw the power of innovation and these tools that we're creating uh, are just going to be so powerful in the 21st century. Um, and we should use them for good. So, um, as you guys know, some of these challenges are enormous. We're putting way too much in the ocean, taking way too much out, uh, way too fast. And that's why X Prize really works on ocean issues in general, right? We work on space, we work on healthcare, we work on artificial intelligence. But we do have a focus on oceans because so many big problems facing the ocean and use technology to help solve them. So uh, XPRIZE Ocean Initiative is actually a commitment to continue doing um, ocean-based activities, ocean-based prizes, uh, with the theme to try and make the ocean healthy, valued, and understood. So we're trying to take these big grand challenges facing the ocean and turn them into opportunities to develop innovations to either better understand or help solve the problem. And uh, that really took us to the, the ocean, um, ocean Health XPRIZE sponsored by Wendy Schmidt. Uh, this is a $2 million prize that I came on to work on to improve our understanding of ocean acidification. This is for breakthrough ocean pH sensors. Um, and we actually did the testing right here at Ambari for quite a while, um, uh, the whole month of testing in those tanks. And the, uh, the winning team was from the great ocean state of Montana, um, Missoula, Montana. We not had an ocean for a very long time. And we got their ocean pH sensor on, wake up with Al. Uh, so very hard to make uh, ocean science that sexy, right? And make ocean acidification a cool, positive story. Very difficult. Uh, but the media definitely loved uh, that they were from Montana and that was part of their storyline. Always tell your story as a scientist. Your personal story is, is really what they're interested in, the media. So uh, we developed this ocean pH sensor. We said, all right, so what? Uh, we have very precise ocean pH data. What does that mean for anybody? And we, so we backed up and we actually talked to NOAA and some other groups, we did some workshops. There's so much ocean data being collected, as was just mentioned, but so little of it is actually being used by you, people that want this information. Um, so we found all of these challenges and opportunities with ocean data. And personally, I think this could be a multi-billion dollar industry, is making ocean data into new products and services. Just based on the app market, where it's headed, and then all of these, these users of ocean information. And a lot of those tools can actually have a great conservation here. So that's why we did a follow-on prize, that ocean pH prize, because we had the ocean acidification data, and we said, all right, so what? We need to turn it into a tool that people can actually use. So we launched the Big Ocean Button Challenge. It's a $100,000 app development competition that we just awarded. Um, and um, this was about turning that ocean data into mobile apps that you can actually use, right? And uh, we just awarded it just recently. You guys can check out um, this article in Scientific American about the seven award-winning apps launch mobile age for the ocean economy. This will give you links to actually download the apps. And it'll give you a better description about the prize, the opportunities here. Um, so we had several categories, specific categories for the, uh, the apps themselves. And, um, and these are actually the winners. So top left is Navisi. You're hearing about ship navigation. Uh, a lot of the small to medium-sized ships don't have great navigation, especially some of the older ones. And so if you actually just, this, this group is actually just taking ocean data and putting it onto a, an iPad, and you can actually just use that now, uh, skip over updating your, your console. And so there's a huge opportunity there with <coughs> NASI and 
internet and, and ship navigation. And they actually want to add whale data, um, whale migration data as well, because the ships plow in the whales and kill them a lot. That's actually a big problem for whales, one of the biggest conservation issues for them. Uh, so they're doing a conservation focus as well. They're the winning of the shipping category. See, status is marine weather and tides. They've actually added a layer on marine protected areas. So they want to be able to give the mariners tools to be able to go out in the open ocean safely, know the marine weather, know the tides, know what's going to be like out there. And they've added additional layers for, OK, don't fish in these areas. That's actually a marine protected area. There are no lines on the ocean telling you, don't fish here. They don't have that information necessarily. So they're going to add that layer as well as the bathymetry data. And that actually could be a top marine weather app. Uh, so pay attention to sea status. Please download all of these apps and try them out for yourself. Uh, they're all in different stages of development. CC app, if anybody has the Android, I'd love to try this out here um, today, if we can. If anybody has an Android um, iPad, or sorry, um, Google Play um, store access, we can do this um, today. Actually use the app to, to visualize the seafloor. So we can use it to actually see the seafloor data. So this is similar to that star app you might have had, where it shows you the constellations. We don't have a great interface with the ocean. It's flat. It's blue. Yeah, it's great. It's vitamins <laughs> as well. Okay, it's blue. It's a blue vitamin. But there's all sorts of cool stuff going on out here. There's an amazing cane right offshore, and you can't see it with your eyeballs. So let's develop some tools to engage people in what's left to discover. Out there. And the CC app is doing a great job of that. Fish angler is about uh, recreational fishing. We don't have good information on recreational fishing, unfortunately. So they want to create a tool that's both beneficial for the recreational fishers, and it's going to give the fisheries management officers that data about where the fishing is happening and how much is actually uh, occurring. That'll, that'll actually help us better protect um, the fish populations and, and understand their stocks. And there's a really cool group here um, called Save the Waves, and uh, they entered um, for the conservation category. And uh, I'd like to congratulate Nick and the entire team as the, as the winners of the conservation category for this prize. Nick, have you told them about the Save the Waves app much? Yeah, okay. So the Save the okay. Uh, so the Save the Waves app, I'll, I'll save some of this, but um, it's for reporting uh, the different hazards out here um, and putting that into a database to be able to respond to it. Uh, very significant in engaging surfers with um, recognizing threats at their break and being able to, to to solve those problems. It's also a potentially hugely important science, citizen science tool to understand coastal erosion and otherwise. So really cool. The SOFI app is about ocean acidification. So this is actually the Service Ocean pH Interactive Explorer, okay, SOFI. And this is the one that you can have ocean pH data and understand is ocean acidification going to threaten the places that you care about? Whether it's an aquaculture farm growing oysters that are very seriously, seriously threatened by ocean acidification or otherwise. So it's, it's a great tool, just visualizes ocean acidification information for your phone, okay? Chile S. Mar is actually connecting a local seafood, uh, or local fishermen, mind you, uh, sorry, uh, with the different seafood retailers in Chile. So this is the first app that's actually doing that. There's a bunch of apps in the United States and the U.S. West Coast that are doing something similar. This is the first time that this has happened in Latin America. They want to spread to Peru and several other countries. So all they're doing is taking some of these old school fishermen, they're reporting, what did I catch today? Posting it on an app, and then people are able to buy it. It's actually creating a great market for for some fishermen that you know they don't have a lot of resources to do this themselves. So um, congratulations to all these teams. Uh, they're doing fantastic work. Uh, we also have an open prize. You can check it out at xprize.org. That we are announcing next week some of the finalists. These are for uh, the underwater drones that can explore the deep sea, map the sea floor uh, to a high resolution. And these are going to be the tools that you can launch autonomously from a beach, go out to the deep sea and then come back to that same spot with information. So taking the ship time out of the equation is really going to help us scale up how we explore and protect our ocean. And unfortunately, the resource extraction gets way ahead of the exploration. Uh, most often, we destroy things before we know anything about them. So I want to just plug my nonprofit as well, um, Colossal, and tell you a little bit about this. So I started up uh, this last year. I've been working on it for a few years now, but really started in earnest last year. It is the first ocean-based um, nonprofit that's based specifically in Venice Beach. Uh, so we do ocean exploration and conservation work. We're trying to work on these really high-profile and engaging expeditions to find and film exotic sea monsters, essentially. Okay? 
And then we want to tie it into a campaign to protect their habitat. So we're taking a very fun, youthful, positive approach to ocean exploration and trying to engage a global audience in what's left out there to discover and what can you do to help protect it. So the whole premise is that we go big to explore and protect our ocean. So this ties in really nicely to board sports. It's actually me on the left and me on the right. <laughs> big time. Um, no, me. So, um, I love this about surfing and snowboarding, right? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. You saw Sean White doing back-to-back -back 1440s. That didn't even exist a few years ago, if you watched the Olympics. It's incredible. And then big wave surfing, absolutely unbelievable. It's just, oh, let's just hop on the back of um, a jet ski. Yeah, pull me into that monster wave. That's crazy. But in conservation, we don't continuously think bigger and bigger and bigger. So it, it is an evolution. We do need to, uh, to improve um, our ability to think big. So with our exploration side, we want to do these big audacious missions that are really easy to explain. Okay, so I'm gonna try and explain it to you in a minute or less the rest of this thing. Um, so we're looking for the biggest squid in the world. It's called the colossal squid. It lives off Antarctica, and it's my favorite ocean animal. This thing has the largest eye in the animal kingdom, has hooked tentacles, weighs over a thousand pounds, it's the largest invertebrate in the world, bigger than the giant squid, and we know very little about it. And when I was studying New Zealand, they brought back a thousand pound one back there and thawed it out and did a dissection of it, which you see on the bottom left. But we still know so little about this animal. It lives off Antarctica in the deep sea, very remote area, and we, and we still have a lot to learn about that area in general. Uh, and we want, to, we want to turn this in to, um, you know, from sea monster status to, I think it's actually one of the most beautiful and amazing animals uh, in the world. Probably glows in the dark and uses bioluminescence in ways that we don't truly understand yet. So we're on this mission to try and find and film the Colossal Squid for the first time. We're engaging audiences around the world, different scientists and engineers to help out with that mission. And we want to tie it in to our conservation campaign uh, that is actually promoting local sustainable seafood in Los Angeles. So we're working with Dock to Dish. It's a community supported fishing group. Uh, and we're trying to spread the use of local sustainable seafood to help solve some of these global problems. Very small print back <laughs> But uh, we can use the local seafood movement to maximize the benefit for the global ocean. If we take off these terrible other brands like bluefin tuna or Chilean sea bass, which is actually affecting the colossal squid's habitat. It's not from Chile, and it's not a sea bass. It's Patagonia toothfish or Antarctic toothfish. But we market these things as good to eat, and they're not. We have much better options right here in California, especially some of the best managed fisheries in the world. Just we don't use them very well. So how do we maximize that benefit? If people get into the local seafood movement, how do we benefit uh, the global ocean with that? Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. He's in the Sacred Valley, went to Machu Picchu. I think I'm holding a second generation iPhone there. Uh, and based on the comments and the looks and the weird things that were happening around me, I think I might have been the first person there to uh, bring selfie stick technology to the sacred site. So uh, I always like to show that. Um, I've uh, spent my career trying to figure out how to do surfing and technology. Um, I spent five minutes trying to find a picture to show that. I didn't do so well. But uh, one day I got to save the, the Waves uh, email newsletter, and in it was uh, this great picture I found of Nick. <laughs> uh, and, but it, it, it was a good video. It was kind of showing his idea for this app. And it was just an idea. These are, you know, it wasn't live. It wasn't anything. Um, it was, it needed work. Uh, and it really resonated with me. It was something that I figured I could actually make an impact on. And so I emailed Nick, and I'm not showing, sending, showing you this email to brag that I'm on a first name basis with Nick now, but to <laughs> show you this, <laughs> to show you the date here. I just wanted to show that this is October 17th. So I went from not knowing this guy to now considering him a good friend and to actually, I believe, making an impact and starting <laughs> to make an impact. So October 17th, keep that date in mind. Uh, so I work uh, part owner of a digital agency in San Diego called MJD Interactive. We're a collective of designers, engineers, um, program management, uh, quality assurance, and we build digital things. Sometimes that's in the physical space, a lot of times that's mobile apps, like the Endangered Waves app, sometimes it's web apps, backend systems, etc. And we follow a process like this. Uh, usually someone comes to us with a problem, and we immerse ourselves in it, and we try to come up with ideas to solve that problem. In this case, Nick and the Save the Waves team and everyone else that he mentioned, already did the immersion, already had the ideas, and so we stepped in at that prototyping phase. And so uh, that prototyping phase is kind of what I just want to show you a really quick peek of how that happens. 
Uh, it starts with a whiteboarding uh, process, and this is a team of very different backgrounds. That's me, uh, Cameron, who's a, he's a jack of all trades. John runs our operations. Tim's a web developer. Uh, Veronica is a front end developer. Uh, we start to whiteboard these things, and we come, we start to coalesce around one of these ideas. If you actually download the app right now, uh, and it's okay if you don't pay attention to me, I'd rather you download the app. But if you did download the app, it would look vaguely, you'd start to see the resemblance of what this whiteboard uh, picture looks like here. And this is how most of this stuff kind of starts is on a whiteboard. It then goes into this wiring process uh, where we use a tool to make wireframes, plan out the app map, uh, and this is where we spend most of our time because it's the most cost effective. Uh, anytime you have an app that's on the store or a website and you need to change those things, it's very expensive. People in tech industry are expensive. I'm expensive. Uh, but this part is very cheap. It's quick. It's easy to change these things. So we make these dumb prototypes that are gray and ugly and we put them on actual devices and we kind of fake the process. We go out in the field. We actually test it because it's so much easier to change with this process. Uh, once we finish that, we go into the high-res design process. And what I'm showing here are designs that never made it into the app. So for every screen that makes it into the app, there was 10 or so that got killed and thrown away. And so these still look good, but they weren't good enough. And what I'm showing here is a screen that actually made it into the app. This is one of the onboarding screens. And in the background, I'm showing the hundreds of screens that didn't make it. And once that design gets kind of approved and we're happy with it, we kind of go into this uh, rapid development prototyping phase. Uh, and that's me working in a tool called Xcode, working on the app. Um, and uh, as a software developer, I always want to show a slide with code. I'm not going to code or anything like that. But uh, part of this is to break down these barriers between tech and coding and uh, what you guys are doing out there in the crowd. Um, it's not scary. It's just a tool. Uh, and so the more I can show it, the more I can use this platform to push code that everyone should be doing it, um, the better. A lot of times we get we run into uh, problems uh, right here. Uh, I ran into an issue where I couldn't get the reports to upload uh, to the back end. Uh, and Veronica, one of our other developers on the team, helped me figure it out. And so I just showed that, that it's a collaborative process internally for us, but it should also be across boundaries, across the tech industry, across the nonprofits, across the government agencies. It should be a collaborative thing. Uh, we do a lot of field testing, so uh, write code, go test it on device. Right here, we were, um, this is Pacific Beach in San Diego, very clean beach. Every morning, someone's out there with an industrial size rate cleaning that beach, so we don't really have a trash problem or <clears throat> anything like that uh, there, but th they can't rake the sun away from us. And so we use the sun here at the beach to test the buttons, to test the font size, to test uh, the contrast on the screen. Make sure this is an app designed to be used outside, not inside in artificial lighting. And so the design of the actual app uh, was designed for that. And so another email, this is the email we got from Apple saying, hey, the app is live. And again, just showing this app, not that I'm on a first name basis with Apple, but to show the date, that's December 4th. So if you remember, October 17th to December 4th, a month and a half from first contact between me and Nick to an app on the store. These things don't have to be so expensive and so big and multi-year things. You can take a small idea and with the amplification effects of technology, we can do stuff really quick and therefore affordably. And so finally, I just kind of wanted to hopefully give you a peek into this process, show you how quick it can go, and start to break down the barriers between uh, the tech industry and your organization. Uh, in summary, you know everyone here should be using technology, software, tools uh, to change, to help them in innovate. Um, technology should be used as an uh, amplification effect. Um, so yeah, let me represent the surf industry. Uh, let me represent the software developers who surf. Um, use me, use us. I want to help. Sometimes I just don't know how. And so this is my first foray uh, into helping. But I, I've got a lot of life left, and I want to help more. So get in touch with me. Let me know how I can help. Thank you. Now we're going to have Shannon uh, talk to us about a hardware project that I think is, is really exciting. Um, OK, so I'm Shannon Waters, and I am with the Surfrider Foundation. And I'm really excited to here to uh, be presenting to you about a new project that's called SmartFin. It's a partnership um, between Surfrider Foundation, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, Future Spins, and um, a nonprofit called Lost uh, Bird Project. Oops, they got blocked out. Lost Bird Project. Hopefully, no one's watched that on the live live cast. So um, uh, many people today have done a really great job of kind of laying out the time frame for um, technology in our in our oceans. And Al mentioned this kind of long 
uh, you know, this long timeline of how um, technology has greatly expanded our understanding and perception of the ocean. It's allowed us to reach places we were never before able to explore, like the deep sea. Maybe you can find colossal, the colossal uh, um, uh, squid. Thank you. I was going to say calamari. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's <allowed> us <laughs> and it's allowed us to identify trends in ocean health that have both local and global implications for human health. Oceanographic sensors like this one pictured here provide all kinds of data to researchers and coastal managers, informing models, predictions, and management plans. Data from these offshore buoys um, are often even make them their way into the wave forecasting models that we heard from Mark earlier so that you can find out what the wave conditions are each morning. The surf zone, however, presents its own unique challenges for sensor observation, and that's due to the dynamic wave energy present there. Anyone who's in the room who's been out on the waves, I'm sure we all have, um, knows that you can get pretty beat up out there, and the same is true for any autonomous sensors that are placed there. So um, any sensors that are de deployed, something like this that was deployed into the waves, that could get buried in the sand, broken, or, God forbid, clock someone in the head. So therefore, we have relatively few sensors that are located within the surf zone themselves, at least not autonomous sensors. So at the same time, surfers spend more time in the water than any other user group. Surfers are there before the sun rises and well after it is set. And many in this room would probably stay all day if you could. And judging from some of the empty seats, maybe some people are out there now. <laughs> at the same time, and also evidenced by the people in the room, Surfers really care about the fate of our ocean and about improving ocean health. So surfers are really well poised to be the voice for the ocean. Why not invite them to participate in oceanographic research? Well, enter the smart fin. The smart fin is a surfboard fin, as I have up here, and everyone's welcome to take a look at it later. It's a surfboard fin with sensors that measure important ocean properties that help researchers and coastal communities understand trends in ocean health. Ultimately, the goal of this project is to bring attention specifically to climate change and to better understand and communicate how climate change alters ocean chemistry. And I'm really glad that this was brought up earlier today by Julie Packard, um, who, who highlighted the fact that climate change really is an ocean story. And marine chemistry is this massive problem that we have very little information about and really needs a lot more attention. So um, related to climate change, to that end, the SmartFin currently measures temperature, motion, and GPS with future sensor development focused on pH, dissolved oxygen, and chlorophyll fluorescence. The way it works is like this. After charging her smart fin, the surfer turns on her fin with three taps. Guys are welcome to participate too, but I highlight a female surfer here. A green light tells her that it's ready to go, and while surfing, the water temperature is logged every six seconds. The IMU, or motion data, is logged at, at five hertz. After surfing, she connects to the charger and opens up an app on her phone. And from there, she can upload her session and see her results. With the smart fin, the surfer becomes a citizen scientist, turning wave sets into data sets, simply while surfing her favorite break. And so for anyone who's interested in seeing a demo of this um, at the paddle out later today, where I'm going to have some fins down on the sand and be giving a demo if you want to see it in action. Um, I also want to give a shout out to a couple of the smart fin surfers in the room. We've got Nick Sadapur out here and Pete Stoffer. And um, if you want an inside scoop on how it all works and their experience, um, I'm going to volunteer you guys up. Feel free to talk to them. <laughs> so we, uh, with this tool, we believe that we can vastly increase the amount of data collected from the surf zone compared to the traditional methods that are currently out there. So on the left, we see an image of all the shore stations that are located in central and northern California. These sensors are at fixed locations, usually located on here, which is about, I don't know, eight or so out there. In comparison, on the right, we have all of the surf breaks within that same area. So if you magnify the number of surf breaks by the number of people surfing them and the, uh, and the amount of spatial resolution that each uh, surfer out there in the water can get just simply while surfing and paddling around, we could have near complete geographic coverage. So last May, the SmartFin project officially launched with a pilot project um, in, the San, in the Surfrider San Diego chapter. We invited 50 surfers to use the SmartFin and asked that they provide us with feedback on the operations and kind of just general feedback of how it was, how it was working for them um, and how well it fit into their surfing routine and lifestyle. In addition, and led by research partners at Scripps Oceanography, 
We monitored where, when, and how often they were surfing, and compared the data collected with their smart bins to that of highly calibrated temperature sensors located at Scripps Pier. And that's what you see here. This is, um, hopefully this works, this is an good slide. Nope, okay. Well, what you can't see pictured here, <laughs> and what you would see if the animation was working is that um, through this pilot, um, we actually, so we, um, we actually had um, just within this specific region here, so La Jolla Shores, and then you can actually, you can see a couple little uh, data points there, but La Jolla Shores all the way up to kind of Blacks, um, or in and around Scripps Pier, we had just um, uh, thousands of data points. So people surfing the, the smart fin out in the water just over a six month period were actually um, really accelerating um, the amount of data points that we could gather as opposed to just the one fixed location at the end of that pier. Um, so also uh, through this pilot, we are looking at um, not only the amount of data that we could that we could gather and, and, and expand on, but um, how well those temperature sensors were actually matching up with um, with this, the sensor at first pier. So obviously, we don't just want to have a bunch of frivolous data sets out there. We want it to be data sets that the research community can pick up and use um, and use with confidence because it's reliable and accurate. So what we did was we, with those same surfers, and here you can see some of them pictured and smiling for you, um, we uh, compared our um, smart pin sensors uh, measured in the black on the top to the uh, temperature sensors at Scripps Pier, which is the blue line um, that has kind of the longer, the longer trend there. Um, so what you can see is that our temperature sensor is mat matching up quite nicely, um, and we actually have a um, accuracy and pre precision of 0.1%, uh, or zero, sorry, 0 0.1 degrees. Um, so sorry, let me just get back to my notes here. Uh, great, so the lessons learned from this pilot will inform the next generation of smart fins expected to, re to be released uh, in fall of this year. Uh, in the meantime, we're working with uh, surf rider chapters to identify where and when to establish new smart fin programs when the new fins become available. So, uh, if you're wondering, as I'm sure some of you are, because I get this question a lot, where can I get one? I encourage you to seek out your local surf rider chapter so that you can um, sign up and potentially even lead a new smartphone program in your area. Talk to Graham. <laughs> you're in LA. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges uh, facing us now is actually finding creative ways to cover the cost of the smartphone. Uh, not just of the fin itself, but of running an entire program like this. So a single smart fin costs, probably the second most um, common question I get, single smart fin costs about $300 just in manufacturing costs alone. So we're currently seeking out crowdfunding and our creative uh, fundraising solutions, and if anyone has ideas for partnerships or collaborations, um, please come find me so we can talk after. And so in addition to surfers, our partners have continued um, to connect with a number of researchers to see how they could really integrate uh, the data into their research studies as well. And so I want to give you um, just a little snapshot of um, what's happening in Plymouth at Plymouth Marine Lab. Um, one of our partners there is Dr. Robert Bruin, and his research routinely uses data collected from satellites to study marine biogeochemistry. But he recently um, looked at how um, satellite data is used to measure sea surface temperature near the coastline, and he found that it was a little inadequate. So what we're looking at here is the results from that study. Um, what he did was he measured um, at three different points. So on, the, on the, the image on the far left, you have an image uh, point in, in blue, in green, and in red. Um, the blue and the green are offshore, and the red is on the coastline. And so he used satellite data to look at what the sea surface temperature was there, and then he used in situ, or in the water measurements, to actually measure what they were um, more accurately. And then he compared them to see how well they matched up. Well, what we found, or what he found, was that um, in the offshore sampling sites, um, so both the blue and the green, um, you can see that there's pretty good agreement. Um, the, I, won't, I won't even try to explain the statistics because I don't understand them myself, but the, lines, uh, the line to the right, as they're um, you know, agreeing there, the, um, uh, uh, they're all you know, in a line moving forward. <laughs> they, um, that's showing that um, the satellite data and the in-situ measurements are um, pretty well aligned, so the um, degrees of temperature are coming close together. But you can see at the top right uh, box that there's a little bit more you know, scattered plots there. And so what that's telling us is that we don't have the agreement between the satellite data and the actual true temperature reading of the ocean at the coastline. Um, and when you look at what that difference is, it, it comes between one to two degrees Celsius of a difference. 
So that might not seem like a lot, but if your studies really depend on having very accurate data, um, the, thank you, the, um, the, it's really important that you have more accurate um, readings and sampling. And so he's actually integrating SmartPen data now into his coastline study so that he can get accurate sea surface temperature readings. So I'm going to just um, very quickly go through these slides because my time is up. Um, but um, looking ahead, there's a number of ways that we could apply the, the study uh, or the, the tool that we have here, the SmartPen. Um, and it really is just getting started. And so um, there's a ton of potential here. And just to highlight a couple things, um, at Surfrider, obviously, we, we work a lot on um, coastal development issues. Um, and so one potential way that we could use this data is um, using the GPS sensors um, and the measurements that we're collecting to look at how our beach breaks change um, when certain development um, projects get underway. Um, and then looking forward, um, with the addition of a future pH and dissolved oxygen sensor, we hope um, to one day be able to monitor uh, the ability and capacity of seagrass ecosystems to buffer against ocean acidification. So just real quick, I want to go back to these faces here because for me, this is really the core of what the project is all about. These are our citizen scientists. Um, they're not, you know, none of them have PhDs um, that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, and they come from all different walks of life. They're not necessarily involved in ecological issues, but they are because of this program now. Um, they love surfing. They want to see their surf breaks protected. Um, they want to learn a little bit more about the ocean. And now they want to learn about marine chemistry, which is not something that usually, you know, gets people excited um, at first thing in the morning. So and then just to loop back um, to something that Michael Stewart said earlier, this is potentially a tool to get surfers to be climate positive. So um, with that, I thank you and uh, look forward to talking to you all. Thanks. First off, uh, big thanks to Rip Curl for letting me have access to this data, especially Shane Helm um, from the Watches and Accessories Division at uh, Rip Curl in Australia. Um, also, I want to acknowledge the two interns who worked hard on this. Chris O'Day, who was a recent grad in um, mechanical engineering from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and um, Jad Rafai, who is a data science uh, master's student from uh, Ecole Centrale in Lille in France. So when I first saw the watch, ads for the watch, I knew immediately this, you know, because I've seen people try and do this before, but I knew immediately that this was a great tool for mapping a, a surf race and figuring out how surf breaks work. So um, I immediately tried to track down people from Rip Curl. I got in touch with Shane, and he uh, agreed to support the project. Um, it was in conjunction with uh, something you may have seen from Ed on Monday with the uh, seven uh, surf breaks that we're studying in New Zealand. And they uh, agreed to support it, supplied some watches, and let us have access to the data set. So anyway, the watch works by collecting basically position data at one second intervals. It uh, decides whether or not you're riding a wave based on uh, the speed change or the acceleration change between two position points in time. So then it breaks these up into little chunks, which are rides or not rides. There's some issues with that. Uh, sometimes you get false positives, but for the most part, it works. But um, the data had a lot of problems when we first got to it. There's a lot of missing data. Um, you know, uh, we had to go through and correct, correct things. There's spot names that were wrong. Um, also, when you synchronize your watch, it's supposed to uh, get uh, uh, swell information. If you synchronize your watch after a day or so, it, um, it uh, doesn't collect the information, so you just had no value. So what we did is we went through, reformatted everything, found all the right timestamps, um, found all the right position locations, got the right tide information, went to global hindcast wave databases and fixed all the wave, tide, wind, and the swell direction information. So um, I, taught, I went through that quickly, but that was actually you know, a lot, a lot of work. Um, we also had to clean up some of the actual wave tracks, um, so we wrote uh, tools to visualize the data in Google Earth a lot easier. You can see people use the watch for lots of different things besides surfing. There's kite surf tracks, probably some kayak tracks, some people in, in, on land doing things, so we had to filter all that out as well. That, some of that's manual, and we're working on automated ways for that as well. So here's some global data from the watch. So, oh, also I wanted to tell you the, the size of the uh, of the uh, data set. There's over a million surf sessions in the data set already. And there's uh, 14,000 different users in basically every surf break on Earth, as you can see. Um, so, you know, most of the users are male, 5% uh, were female, but 40% didn't respond. Um, more natural floats than goofy floats, and again, 50% didn't respond. 
meeting age 35 years old. So 35 year old dudes have watches. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also interesting that you know about 50% didn't respond to the demographic data um, of the people who made accounts. In terms of global usage, uh, most surfs happen in Australia, but the most surf break is actually in Japan, and the second most surf break is in El Porto, in Los Angeles, and um, and that's probably because uh, uh, all the tech stuff happening down there, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, you can go down the list, all the you know the, a lot of the usual suspects, big name surf spots. So some analysis now. I chose to focus on the El Porto data because um, I lived there for a bunch of years. I know the break really well. Also had lots of uh, data to go through. So the more data you have, the better you can do uh, statistics and understand things. So El Porto is on the west coast of uh, or, you know, San Juan Bay, Los Angeles. Uh, gets swells from the west and uh, a little bit from the northwest. Actually, in southwest too, but um, not real southwest well. Um, some basic data, what are people, uh, when are people using the, you know, when are they surfing the most at El Porto? So the first one is, is uh, all the surfs from the four years, but broken up into their weekly category through the year. And you see that, you know, there's that big drop off in uh, the late summer, early autumn when there's not a lot of swell coming in. And, um, you know, the strong, highest number of surfs in the um, early part of the year when the sandbars are best, so January, uh, February, March time. And if you look at the next one over to the right is the, the number of surfs through the entire four-year data set. And we're looking at see if there's actually a drop-off in usage. And there was a bit of a drop-off, but then it seemed to come back again. And then on the bottom, I have uh, you know, the number of uh, surf sessions against different tide levels, swell heights, and swell directions. And you know, as expected, uh, medium tide, medium-sized swell from the west is when people surf the most at El Porto. But we knew that, but we're just trying to develop automated ways to do it, because then you can apply it later to other services. <coughs> so then we wanted to get more into the, um, uh, you know, what is the functional performance of a surf break and under what conditions. So we plotted up all the data against, or all the ride length and rights and user speed information for every single wave ridden in El Porto that was recorded by the watch against every environmental variable. So, um, you know, swell height, swell period, and we and swell uh, direction, tide level, all this stuff, and you see. You know, we made these heat plots that show sort of the intensity of the, of the number of sessions or number of waves for each type, but you don't really see any clear patterns like what really influences uh, it the most. This is for uh, ride length. We also did it for surfer speed. Um, but which factor has the greatest influence? So you do this with a multivariate analysis and you can go through the statistics and uh, Bang, at uh, El Porto, it's, the answer is swell direction influences ride length and surfer speed the most. Um, next comes swell height, and then it's followed by tide conditions. So that's just one example. Of course, you'd have to run this analysis for every break to get the, find out which is the factor that is the most important. Um, and so that's just, again, setting up a process that we can use. Now, I think the most powerful use of this data is going to be in the spatial analysis. So, here we have the top five users at El Porto. So I took the top five because if you plotted everyone, it's just a, a way bigger schmear. But that's top five, then it broke it up, user one, two, three, four, five down there. And you can see, you know, it's kind of like tracking animal behavior. We're part of the ecosystem, so you're, you're basically tracking animal behavior, which, where do they like to feed, or where do they like to surf, which bank do they like the best, who surfs Rosecrans, who surfs, you know, the, the one in front of the Alfredo's uh, little uh, snack bar there. And then the, the number one user, that's his sessions from the winter of 2015, what it looks like. So there's obviously that one sandbar right in front that he liked. And then there's one session. This guy actually had like 40-something waves in one session. And it was pretty impressive. Uh, I was like, wow, that must have been a good day. And, um, and then there's what one wave looks like. So there's just ways we can process it up and plot it. Now, this is pretty cool. This is taking just the takeoff spots. And on the left is trestles, and on the right is El Porto. And this is the full four years of data. We're just plotting the, where the person takes off at, so the beginning of each ride track. And you can see patterns of you know, usage. And let's we'll watch that for a sec. But uh, if we now stop it, I'll show you the highlights. So in um, El Porto, so we know, if you know El Porto, um, in the late autumn, the, uh, the sandbars are all close to the beach. And it's a lot of closeouts, and the waves are smaller, and you can see the spread of the surfers right there. But then as you get into March, you know, the sandbars form up, you get the big rips, and look where the surfers go. Bang, right onto, this, onto that. So you can use these as a proxy for morphology. Happened year on end. Um, that 2017 sandbar looked like it was really well-defined. 
um, than it trestles in the winter. Look at lowers, how it spreads out that peak. And you know, uh, lowers on a west swell gets kind of spread out like that. But then look at lowers in July, and everything's really tightly packed on the focus that comes up the delta. So again, just something, a uh, way to track morphology using surfer paths. So New Zealand, we have uh, some seven breaks um, that we talked about, that we studied, that's the collection of our data. Did all the same stuff, just went through all the statistics and um, you know, ride length, surfer speed, blah, blah, blah. When are they surfing for the different conditions? You can see some differences between beach breaks and point breaks. You know, some like higher tides, lower tides, whatever. But one interesting thing that I found was um, that at, uh, oh, got funny there, but um, that really the surf breaks are all quite similar in terms of your speed. The median or the mean, uh, median speed is right around 22 kilometers per hour, whether you had a beach break or a point break. And that on beach breaks, the, the ride length, which is the, uh, the, the, the red ones, the 69, the 70, and the 57, so like 60 to 70 meters is the ride length on the three beach breaks. And these are beach breaks that are, or in the 70 at the bottom. These are four beach breaks that are on four completely different oceans, completely different beaches, completely different wave climates, but they all have the same ride length and very similar speeds. So now what? Got a minute? Um, so <coughs> what else we do? I had ideas, you know, surf performance and training. These are some uh, rides during WSL events, Wilkinson and Medina pipeline in various places. There's not very much pro data in the data set. Uh, you can see, like, you compare pros versus non-pros at pipeline, there's very little difference. Doesn't surprise me, but at trestles, there's a big difference. You can see longer waves, faster waves by the pros. You have a much wider spread of users at trestles. Um, we have some detailed mapping of uh, Bingen, the reef break in Bali, perfect little wave, and um, we mapped it in great detail a few years back. You can put the ride takeoff spots, you can see right where the wave is focusing, and the ride tracks, and we're working now to add this to mix this in with wave breaking models and uh, then predicting surfers using computer models to and wave breaking models. So that's next on our list. Now, uh, surf break protection and management. So um, uh, spatially looking at surf breaks, where are the zones that people use? This is Bastion Point in Australia. And they built a boat ramp through the break in 2013. And uh, so look how the surf tracks have been affected by it. Unfortunately, we don't have any pre-data to, to actually look at that. It would be good. Um, here's one where we may have some pre-data from Martha Lavinia, which is an ongoing issue with the fish farms. There's a few tracks that could be used um, as information. And um, marine, um, world surf reserves, we're looking at boundaries and extents, user patterns, you can get access points, egress points, because um, people leave them on as you go in and out of the water. And uh, so we have obviously tons of data in Santa Cruz, not a whole lot in Ensenada. Punta de Lobos has a lot of tracks as well. And you can also monitor these breaks over time. And if things change, uh, you will be able to note it. So that's the end. And um, thanks.